Tower of God content, even though everyone's pretty much checked out of Tower of God and it's really sad right now. But hey, we got what bomb versus Udik Mazino could have been. Tower of God Season 2 cut content from Mr. Any News. Let's get it. All right. Season 2 hasn't really been the greatest, but mm. hopefully I can make it better by filling in some of the gaps for you. Season 2. A lot of people actually compare Season 2 right now, this treatment, to Classroom of the Elite. And I think that you're delusional if you believe that the Classroom of the Elite anime adaptation got the same treatment as Tower of God. C listen, I know the light novel cut content. I understand the greatness of the Classroom of the Elite light novels. What Studio Lurch did with the anime seasons is lackluster. But it is not the same as what's happening with Tower of God Season 2. Coat was so fucking good, even if they were butchering and going light speed pace, you know, cutting out content. The anime delivered entertainment. Right now, season two, I don't even know what the fuck is actually happening. And I'm paying attention to the plot. No, I know what's happening, but I don't know what's happening. We get introduced to a completely new roster of characters that it's hard to just care about immediately because they're completely new. People only care about the season one core roster. Already you're at a disadvantage. We're doing random bullshit tests with a so totally separate group. And there are some interesting uh, points like Fug Slayers and Karaka, Jinsung and, and, and that. But it just feels like we're just doing meaningless shit. And eventually we're going to meet at the workshop. But it's, it's just everything just feels very fragmented. It's not capturing the same feel as what people expect the season one to be. But it is what it is. I can't do anything about the early 2000s shonen style animation, but what I can do is add much needed context that will liven up the story a bit. I even have this better animated version of the Bam vs. Urek fight for you. What? So, if you want to know what it is that you're missing from the anime, stick around as I'll continue what I started last video. Who animated this A shit? thorough breakdown starting from right before the room test, working my way up to the epic showdown that could have been. It's everything you'd probably want to know to enjoy this story to its fullest. Alright. Let's get started. Now, given how far we are in the story, the room test really isn't all that important anymore. I mean, I could explain the rules and go over the conditions for Bam and the others winning, but what's really important <laughs> no one is gives the a move fuck Bam anymore. made to ensure that he won. It was in this moment here when he gave Bam the remote that the connector inside was actually his. You see, Bam was gonna pass the test regardless. By changing the connector from Love's to his own though, Bam stealing the room ensured him and all the others passed along with him. He had essentially tricked Bomb into stealing the sixth and final room for them. Whether Bomb knew or not is up for you to decide, but that's how all eight of them ended up on a team together. Sure. The sweet and sour team as we find out a little bit later. Not to be confused with Prince's recommendation of the devil and I. <laughs> Prince's recommendation was devil and I? <laughs> that's an edgy name. Sweet and sour, but that's like a callback to that kid. Nia, I think. Sweet and sour, poor kid. Now. Other minor details include aesthetic changes for the whole bomb versus love fight, the complete removal of pockets which is the core item enabling player communication, mm. an attempted fight between Prince and Rap Devil, then love's disregard for Nia- The hell? Prince actually put up a fight? Cause this dude just like, kicked Prince's head and made- I, I forget, it was one clean strike and it was kind of hilarious how fast he just- Prince just got knocked down, but I guess he actually put up a fight. Love's disregard for Nia since people dying happened all the time during tests. There was also the reason for Rap Devil acting dead, which was to wait and see where the location was. Yeah, this was scene, that scene right, right there! <laughs> That's yes, what I'm talking about! Was somewhat implied, but the remote itself was neither animated nor mentioned as the motivation for this scene. Lastly, there was an additional interaction between Bomb and Love, where after seeing Bomb flawlessly recreate skills it took Love tens of years to learn himself, he couldn't help but think it'd be a waste to have him fail here. Mm. Especially if he the used respect. his powers for good. That's why Bomb didn't immediately fail when Love got the connector, since the offer to take teammates and reject Fug was still on the table. Love was giving Bomb one last chance here. Now, you may have thought Wang Nan's change of heart here to be a bit abrupt, and that's because the actual reason behind it wasn't even mentioned. Hmm? You see, the whole reason he wanted to forgive was- That's a whole ass actual fucking Pokeball, dude. I know that it's, it's, we've been memeing around with like Pokeballs, but like, dude, it's like in the webtoon, it isn't- actual pokeball it's because if he forgave lurker here then the ones who nia tricked might forgive her too 
This whole ladder of deception wasn't the result of any one single person, but was rather a product of the tower itself. Power betrayals. So Wangnan didn't think it right to blame Lurker for what had happened, since just like Nia, he too was a product of circumstance. That's right. Simply hammering down the symptoms is not going to, you know, fix the root cause. What is... Like, these dudes are simply the byproduct of the tower's culture. And if you want to change this shit, you need to attack it at the root. You need to change how the tower's culture is and get rid of this whole eat or be eaten mindset from people. Or else people are just going to continuously step on each other and backstab to climb higher. The tower just had a way of changing people for the worst. It was an unfortunate byproduct for Bitch. those who chose to climb it. That's why Wang Nan wants to change it, since no matter how foolish or impossible it may be, something needed to change within the tower. What a good guy. Even if he was betrayed thousands of times over, he'd still continue climbing in pursuit of that dream of his. It was after the test that there was a small bit of team bonding, most of which was me saying and go sing praising Wang Nan. Mm. Arc Raptor was staring off to the side, hinting at some sort of interest towards Wang Nan in general. Okay. Now, it's here in the other scene with Love and the Supervisor that they really missed the mark on why Love was so emotional. Love was so emotional because he could get extra sauce with the fried chicken, right? Or at least that's what it seemed like in the anime. Reason being that it significantly understates the impact of what Love had done here. Not only did he botch a test in the way the floor ruler couldn't overlook, but his stunt with Bug Slayer had already spread everywhere around the tower. He had inadvertently given Bomb more publicity than Bug could have ever hoped for. The hell? People outside knows about what happened in here? Like, shit like this. Again, like, wouldn't it be nice to have, like, a clash between Veal and a fucking test and an admin to go public and then to have the public's like, fucking re reaction to it? Or potentially other people that we know from season one reading some kind of newspaper to highlight like how much they, I don't know, could think about how Bam is alive or like look at the power and the glaze. Like shit like that would be so hype, but like, again in the anime it is just so bare bones. Resulting in news that now gave criminals everywhere new motivation. Ah, that's what they are. <laughs> I am the real Juvial Grace. This was all things Augustus would have to take responsibility for, which is why Love was so upset about it. His boss had decided to take all the heat for him. Moving Good on guy. to episode. But the boss at the end of the day was technically within Fug's group, right? Even if he's not directly Fug, it seems like he's working with them as he said, all right, Wang Nan's passed as Fug wishes or something. So uh, this guy, I, I don't think he, tr I, don't, I don't think Love really knows what Augustus is all about. Moving on to episode five now. This to me was by far the best episode of season two. Not only did it finally update us on what happened to everyone else from season one, but they didn't skip anything which did absolute wonders for the pacing. Oh yeah, this is the Blue Turtle uh, revenge plot revelation, right? That was one of the best episodes of season two for sure. But after that, it just feels like a bunch of scattered random tests. We're just doing random time skips. We're at different floors. I have no understanding of the continuity of the story. We just happen to be doing a random fucking test for no fucking reason. I'm like, what's going on right now? Is it just me? Because I feel like I'm really trying to pay attention to the story and try to fucking understand. And I do understand what's going on. But it just feels like everything is so jagged. There is these nonsensical fucking skips. And I'm like, we, what the fuck are we doing? I found myself genuinely entertained watching Kun interact with Rachel. Especially when we find out he actually knows that she's lying mm -hmm. to him. Then to see him put together this all-star team just to deal with her. Pion. Well, that to me is so much more interesting than the stuff going on with Bam right now. 100%. I do not give a fuck about Team Sweet and Sour Pork unless Veal is doing something crazy with Fug-related things, right? The whole season one was built upon Rachel and like everything falling off because of her. And now we get little to none of that. And it's like, do you wonder why people don't really give a fuck about this show right now? And that's not even talking about the fucking lack of the animation. Unfortunately, there isn't much to add with regards to the events of all this, but in the antidotes from the author, he did mention something interesting. It was a brief explanation behind the way time worked in the tower. Mm -hmm. So, while all this stuff with Kun did take place six years after the events of season one, in terms of how long that is with respect to us, it's actually only about one to two years. What? There's apparently few. What the fuck is real time though? Outside the tower, but we're always within the tower. 
I don't know, like... <laughs> the more we spend time in the tower, right, the less... The, like, like, look at this ratio. So does that mean, eventually, if someone is able to get out of the tower, like Urek Mazino claims that he wants to go surpass the tower, like, why would this be given? To show that not that much time has passed outside and to highlight then what? There's apparently fewer days in the years within the tower making it so people live longer and time feels different. Hmm. Then when someone finally becomes a ranker, that difference in their perception of time gets even bigger. And it doesn't even fucking matter because you can just use Shinsu to do whatever you want. Like, my understanding of why people are hundreds of hundreds of years old but they look like a toddler or something is purely through Shinsu. It was stated over and over again in Season 1 that Shinsu can do literally anything. And Dorsey looks like this, despite being hundreds of years old, because of Shinsu. Not simply because of the passage of time is flowing differently. No, the age is the same. Your physical appearance and shit, that's all Shinsu. Anchor, that difference in their perception of time gets even bigger. It's a pretty complex topic that supposedly relates to something bigger. Hmm. For now though, that's the basics of what you should know about it. Looks like there's something setting something up when we do eventually meet people outside a tower or surpass the tower because... You wouldn't just give that passage of time difference unless it actually really mattered outside. Switching back to the story with Bum, there was a cut scene between Yiwa and her family member. Okay. A conversation that shed a bit of light on Yiwa's character while at the same time painted an image of how the tower perceives Bum and his party. The former is just Yiwa making it seem like everyone passed because of her, while the latter is another <laughs> misconception in which the tower thinks Bum and his party are evil. Steal money and harass girls? He would never. Those were the two key things to take away from this. Fast forward to when Yiwa is trailing Bum, and the main reason she's able to find him at all is because she had registered his pocket for a tracking service. <laughs> so long as a She is actually the worst fucking girl. Dude, I don't care. This girl fucking sucks. Even having cut content makes her suck even harder. Like... She does nothing. She's a bitch. And lately, she's been getting a lot better. Absolutely, right? The whole revelation of the Yun family being behind, behind like the whole uh, price gouging and uh, control over the flower shit. Yeah, yeah, we know. And now she wants to better herself and fix the clan's reputation for sure. But like everything leading up to that, holy shit, she's an omega bitch. Mutual agreement was made. Her pocket and his are currently able to track each other. <laughs> It makes it so that no matter where he goes, Yiwa would be able to find him. Insane. It's when everyone goes to Bomb's house after that the reason Bug chose him was finally explained to us. To make it as clear as possible, Bomb's one of the few people capable of killing Jihad. Why? You see, since the contract between him and the Guardians makes him invincible to those within the tower, to kill him requires the power of an irregular hey, prison existence from outside the tower. I don't know exactly what the contract with the what? And the Guardians Jihad. You see, since the contract between him and the Guardians makes him invincible- The Guardians, I have no clue what the Guardians are. I know of floor admins, right? I know like that thing that we talked to in Season 1. But I'm not sure if that's a Guardian. But Zahad has connection with the Guardians of the Tower. He is basically unkillable if you're a regular. But if you're an irregular, you cannot bypass that. ...to those within the Tower. To kill him requires the power of an irregular who's in existence from outside the Tower. As for Hajin Sung, while he does come from the same family as Yuri, his oh. position within ranks significantly higher. Oh, that would have been so much cool if we knew, right? The Ha last name, the surname, then like Yuri's Yuri Ha. Do we know that Yuri Zahad? Did her? No, we wouldn't have been able to make the connection because every one of them has it's just Zahad. The Ha last name would have been erased. Yuri, his position within ranks significantly higher. Then, as a high ranker who's climbed the tower already, under normal circumstances, he wouldn't be able to associate with Bam and the other regulars, but Hwad Yun makes exceptions like that possible. It's all thanks to her specialty position as a guide. Not to mention, being Fug makes rules like that non applicable to them anyway. Okay. Now, Bam's true identity came as quite the shock, far more to the Wangnan from the Manwa. Viole being an irregular wasn't something he could just simply disregard like that. You know what's funny? It's the fact that he's getting shocked that Viol is an irregular. But wait until we figure out that he's the actual fucking Prince Zahad. Like, you are hiding a secret bigger than what we're hiding. Viole being an irregular wasn't something he could just simply disregard like that. 
A minor detail left out from the flashback was the way Fug established its method of tracking everyone. You see, right before Bum's old party left to go to the next floor, you gave them a ring as a sort of memorial gift. A ring. This could serve as a memorial of their GPS. accomplishment, or more importantly, a Tracking. memorial of Bum. Either way, it's an important memento they're unlikely to give away to anyone. That being the case, they were the perfect items to also serve as tracking devices. A so clever method deceptive. of knowing exactly where all of them were. It's why Yu is able to threaten them so easily. This obviously didn't sit well with Wang Nan, but the way Hua Diyun challenged his ideals was rather interesting. She mentions how sympathy and justice aren't always the answer. A direct confrontation to everything Wang Nan supposedly fights for. Basically, your ideals are fucking nothing if you cannot accomplish them with brute force. Anyone can talk about justice, but to actually deliver results with power is a completely different thing. You can cry about it all you want, but the people that actually do make changes are the people with power. A direct confrontation to everything Wang Nan supposedly fights for. To her, anyone can talk about justice, but until she sees Wang Nan doing otherwise, he's pretty much no different from them. They're both using Bum's power to achieve their goals. So, with all that said, there's three main questions that need to be asked now. Why is Fug trying to kill Jahard? How did Jahard become the king of the tower? And why does Murchia want to make Bum a slayer? The story- Who the fuck is Murchia? What? Have you heard this name before in your life? I thought that Yuhan Song wanted Bum to become a slayer. Who the fuck is Murchia? Why, how did Zaha become king of the tower? Wasn't he like the first to climb to the top? He was like one of the first, right? His party cleared the tower first and then made contracts with the guardians, I guess, whatnot, and then got the power first. Why is Fug trying to kill Zahad? Because Zahad rule over the tower is something Fug does not like and they want to bring like change to the tower. I don't know exactly what Zahad does wrong, but if you look at the princess system, it looks kind of fucked up, right? That's my interpretation of the story. I don't know who the hell Murcia is, though. Murcia wants to make Bama Slayer. The story is one that revolves around Jahard and the Ten Great Families, so these underlying questions are just some of the core plot's starting points. Obviously, we won't get answers to them for a while, but they are good to keep in mind as you continue the series. Small hints towards their answers are given all throughout the story. Fast forward now to the day of the test, and in addition to the initial stage being shown, there were a bunch of little things left out from the next. Small details and minor comments that really add life to each of the characters. Prince and Kang can be seen playing in the background. Yiwa was trying to be serious yet putting on tanning oil. Wang Nan was complaining about how the test was so ridiculous, then Gosang actually believed it to be quite fun. She was also worried about the others, but the groups they split up and were far stronger on Bomb's side. Now, for a bit of context on the test itself, it wasn't so much the flower that the supervisor was after, but rather the jewel that the flower is known to produce. You see, the color of that jewel was so incredibly unique that its limited existence made it considered to be both rare and beautiful. And that's what the Yun family was capitalizing on, right? By having control, um, control over the production of this shit, they can set the prices because they're the only one with the supply. Its value stems from both those attributes, along with the fact it can only be found within the endangered Zagena. So, it's that jewel which Bam and the others needed to find. Naturally, it made sense to split up, so that's what they did by separating into two teams here. If you're wondering how Prince and Kang ended up on their own too, it's just because they went in ahead while Bam met up with Yiwa. She had swam away by herself, not noticing that Kang was carrying the rest of them. <laughs> now, before we get into the whole encounter with Uruk, there were a lot of role-specific abilities that were highlighted here. Okay. Gosang used flow control to manipulate Shinsu with her lighthouse, while Misang used her observer to keep track of the pig's location. Yeah, that stuff like this would be a lot more helpful. Because to me, it just feels like Gosang and Misang are literally just fucking deadweight characters that have no reason to exist other than be a love interest for Horyang and a daughter for AK Raptor. To them, to me, those two are like, why the fuck are they still in this party? But they are useful. Wang used her observer to keep track of the pig's location. Both were used in combination with the others, since synergy like that was completely standard for regulars here. It may not seem like it when compared to Bomb, but to make it to floor 20 is no minor accomplishment. So even if one or two of them did get mostly carried, 
the weakest members of Bomb's team still aren't completely useless. To me, they seemed incredibly useless because the anime does not highlight any of that shit. It's just like mind-blowing how Misling and Gosling are still around, but it, they do serve a purpose. We also saw Prince use what's called Triple Field, which- Yeah, that's actually pretty impressive, right? Not controlling more than one Light Cube, right? Not, it's not, I don't think it's the same thing as like multiple bongs, like the Shinsu stuff, but this is pretty impressive. Which is pretty much flow control just with a new name that he made up. It essentially restricts movement by controlling the flow of Shinsu from around the lighthouse. Something only possible when a target is within the lighthouse's infield. Now, this is when Urek makes his entrance, which to be fair to the anime is done I guess accurately enough, but Hello, the intensity baby. and atmosphere that should have come along with it was definitely more on the lackluster side. Absolutely, right? Even if the fight was short in the webtoon itself, the anime's direction and the lack of animation quality just makes Urek Machino not as impactful as I would have imagined. I mean, it's not often we get to see a literal top 5 ranker, so the pressure this man should be exuding needs to be immense. Mm -hmm. The Manwa had him slowly emerge from the corpses of the parasites he just meteor slammed, which is a far cry from the static pans of these two shots. His presence was so perceptibly superior too that Kang could tell he was stronger just by sensing the way Shinsu flowed around him. It was immediately clear that Urek didn't belong here. The conversation after went pretty much the same, but for Kang, he believed all this was a setup by the test supervisor. To him, he thought they were trying to set Bomb up, and that led him to reveal Bomb's oh, position as a Slayer candidate. A conspiracy. This was what piqued Urek's interest in Bomb, and is likely the reason Urek even chose to entertain him in the first place. As expected, such a fight was incredibly brief, but a lot could have been done to better highlight the fact Urek is, well, Urek. Or you could have done more fucking anime original scenes, bro, to make the fight cooler. Like, just because the webtoon had a short fight, you don't need to do a one-to-one -one comparison. I would have been totally fine with our anime original shit to highlight the powers of Urek Mazino, but we just got just like a glowy shit, just kind of, I don't know, anticlimactic ending. Yes, the fight did capture the events as it happened in the manhwa, but that's pretty much all it did. Normally, I'm not the one to complain, but when the mobile game has a cinematic looking like this, I can't help but think of what could have been. <laughs> the mobile game. The mobile game cutscene is better than the anime, bro. What the fuck? What studio is this? What? What? Tower of God Season 2. What fucking studio is this, bro? Let's look at this shit. Let's look at this shit, bro. Hold up. The answer studio. Yep. Here's your answer. Fuck this studio and everything it stands for. <laughs> they haven't done shit. All their animes is some old bullshit and cart like children's cartoons. When the fuck was this City Hunter? 2023? It's not like you have multiple fucking projects. Like, how are you this fucking garbage? They have a YouTube channel. 1.59k subs. Last video eight years ago. They have a Twitter. Tower of God. You have the fucking balls to include Tower of God in your fucking bio. <laughs> the Prince's Return will start broadcasting July 7th. You are a fucking embarrassment. This studio is so fucking garbage, bro. Holy shit. Is there anyone dunking on them for their fucking Tower of God shit? Do they post anything Tower of God related? Like, it is genuinely fucking aggravating. Let's look at this shit. This episode was fucking garbage. To the studio answer studio, is this the level of production you'll be deliver <laughs> on the factory battle arc? I think this is the, uh, what's it called? The, uh, ah, fuck. The workshop, right? <laughs> it's better to cancel the Tower God anime because we don't deserve to see you disgraced webtoon. I 100% agree with this take. And then some people are literally going to get on their fucking knees and start fucking deep-throating the corporations and say, you should be lucky 
You should be grateful that you're even getting an anime adaptation. Shut the fuck up, retard. What a dumb fucking monkey opinion. I'd much rather wait another 5-10 years to get a proper adaptation. Listen, we got time. I'm willing to wait, but you deliver a shit fucking adaptation, it's gonna kill all the hype and momentum and even potentially season 3 will not be done. Fuck it, I want some other studio to take season 2 content and readapt this shit, dude. I'll say once again, please stop destroying the Tower of God webs out of respect for foreign fans and SIU. I agree, bro. Holy shit. The episode was amazing. With perfect pacing and well-crafted scenes. 10 out of 10. This guy's baiting. This guy's baiting. You have to be baiting, right? <laughs> I, I, I don't know how to read this shit, so I'm going to translate to English here. Okay. I agree with them on the above rate. What? Understand. I don't know. People as standard Jutsu and Steven. You are actually... I'm not asking for you foldable level animation. I'm not. But you're gonna actually sit here and glaze this episode where fucking VO was moving? Like, he's a fucking VTuber swaying back and forth. Like, this entire animation... Quatro versus Viol was literally Viol V2 rig swaying left and right, bro. Like, holy sh- And you're gonna call this a 10 out of 10? Actual fucking retard. We need a response to the complaints, please. They're not gonna respond, right? It's in their best interest to keep quiet and not respond to the hate. It's not gonna do anything good. It's smart for them not to respond. I'm severely disappointed. I am. Very disappointed in animation show this season. Please seek help. <laughs> Please seek help. If anything, I think we need to seek help for being this terminally online. That's gross. It's horrible. Please delete the second core. <laughs> oh, what is this glaze? Amazing episode. Perfect pacing scene and nice way to introduce the box. Please add. I cannot believe it, bro. There's genuinely people calling these episodes a 10 out of 10 when it barely is 6 out of 10. There's no way. There is no shot you genuinely feel like this. How can you as a studio be so lazy with this animation? The manhwa was insane, but what you did with this anime needs to be answered. I agree, bro. Do not animate anyway. Exactly. Garbage animation. I 100% agree with all these things, and I don't think that they're wrong. What we're seeing of season two is an absolute fucking disappointment. Yeah, you can fucking cherry pick these nice frames and they look colorful, vivid, vibrant even. <laughs> but you actually see this shit, not a PowerPoint presentation, but an actual animation. You'll realize that it's fucking garbage. This studio is fucking trash. 100%. The answer studio Nah, you need to answer the fans of why you did this to Tower of God. How the fuck could a legendary webtoon series like Tower of God get this fucking treatment? I don't understand. While game has a cinematic looking like this, I can't help but think of what could have been. A fucking mobile game is doing better than that fucking answer studio! I understand not every anime can get the Jujutsu Kaisen treatment, but for a series as prominent as Tower of God, I'm expecting something more than what's pretty much slightly dynamic manhwa panels, mm -hmm. especially with- Exactly what he said. Slightly dynamic manhwa panels. Literally, just taking the manhwa and making a little bit more fluid. That's all they're fucking doing! With season 1 setting the baseline for it. Like, just take a look at the type of vibe Urek gives off both here and in the manhwa. <sighs> as soon as he sees- Just watching this shit makes me sad. It genuinely fucking kills me inside. Bomb actually wants to fight a whole different, even more aggressive side. Look at this, bro. Look at the impact from these fucking webtoon frames. We'll never get any of that in the anime. Out of him comes out. It's made clear that whatever Urek's about to do next, it's him not holding back anymore. A shift in tone that sets the stage for his super inferno punch against Bomb's flare wave explosion. An extra touch I'm particularly fond of from the cinematic is the way Urek keeps his hands in his pockets here. Mm, makes him look it's more cocky such a and controlled. It's nonchalant way of fighting that yep. really highlights how he perceives all this. At least up until Bomb proves he's actually worth fighting. Getting back to the cut content now, there isn't much else to really comment on, but there was visible fear on these three when they first approached Urek. Having just watched Bomb get demolished, though clearly afraid to step up and fight, Poryang is Pookie Bear 
jacket that Kosen gave him is funny here in this context. They did so anyway because Bam was their teammate. It was this courage that resonated with Uruk, leading him to leave behind the flower for them. But yeah, that's pretty much all that I wanted to talk about for this one. I saw all your comments on the last video, so I figured it was time to make a new one. Mm. If you want another, then just keep letting me know, and if Absolutely. you liked what you saw, then leave a like. Also, let me know what your thoughts are on Season 2 so far. You already know I'd mine. I'd love to see some of your opinions, too. Y'all already know my opinion on Season 2, and hey, please, go give Mr. Any News a like on the video. Go check his channel out, but again, it is just so sad. So sad that a fucking mobile game cutscene is more hype than what the anime is delivering. The answer studio is so fucking trash. I hope they never adapt an anime again.